Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Data Applications and Supply Chain Research webinar. It's the second in the trilogy of ITRI's Economic and Policy Assessment Group's webinar series. Uh, I'm Steve Burt, and I will be co-moderating our session today with Eugene Murray. We have an excellent panel of four speakers with us today who will be presenting. Uh, first, we will have Dana Magliola, and he'll be presenting on key insights related to freight and maritime data. Uh, second, we will be having Dr. Robert Hanfield present, and he'll be shedding light on the transfer, transformation and digitization of supply chains, including how data is being used in supply chain functions. Dr. Heidi Schweitzer will be speaking third, and she'll be highlighting the effects of US energy policy on agricultural rail markets. And Emmeline Michaela will be closing out the ticket today. She'll be demonstrating how to visualize transportation data using Tableau. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some of the ways in which you can interact with our speakers. At the bottom of the screen, you'll notice that there's a Q&A tab and you can enter any questions that you have for a speaker here. Um, both Eugene and I will be monitoring the um, Q&A tab. So anything that comes through, we'll make sure that your um, question gets addressed to the speaker. And, and after each panelist presents, we will leave time for them to address any questions that you may have for them. Uh, additionally, you may choose to ask one of the speakers um, a question um, directly. And um, if so, please raise your hand virtually. At the bottom of the screen, um, you'll notice that there is a hand. So if you click on that, it's um, a virtual way to raise your hand, so to speak. And then um, Eugene or I can unmute you so you can ask your question. So um, either of those two ways work, either typing in the Q&A or raising, raising your um, virtual hand. So um, with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the, the impetus for today's webinar is to gain access to expert insights, techniques, and applications for using data in the supply chain. And I'm really excited to see what our uh, speakers have in store for us today. I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce our first speaker, Dana Magliola. Dana leads the North Carolina Department of Transportation's Office of Logistics and Freight, connecting the economy to infrastructure investment. The Office of Logistics and Freight is, a, is active across the spectrum of NCDOT project delivery from planning through construction. Dana joined NCDOT in 2018 from NC State University, where he led the Supply Chain Resource Cooperative at Poole College of Management, as well as served as the Supply Chain Management Subject Matter Expert for NC State's Industrial Extension Service. A graduate of the University of Virginia, Dana began his career in transportation with Danish container shipping giant AP Moller Maersk, uh, Maersk Line, and later worked for Freight Forwarding Division of uh, the UPS Logistics Office. Uh, Dana is contributing a contributing author to the Material Handling and Logistics US Roadmap 2.0 and a regular contributor to MHI Solutions Magazine, Supply Chain and Demand Executive Magazine, among others. Beyond transportation, Dana is also the longtime head coach of the NC State Sailing Team and speaks regularly on leadership beyond athletics to a wide spectrum of audiences. So um, Dana, I'm gonna pass it over to you now. And um, you know, there's a, a share button at the bottom of the screen and, and let me know if you have any difficulties sharing. All right. Steve, thank you so much for that introduction and uh, thanks for having me today as well. Let me get my technology situated and we'll get going. Uh, so again, good afternoon and thanks to the great team at ITRI for inviting me to present today. Uh, as Steve told you, my name is Dana Magliola and I'm the program manager for NCDOT's Multimodal Logistics and Freight Program and serve as our subject matter expert on supply chain management here at DOT. I feel a lot like uh, the unknown opening band, but I'm excited to be a part of such a great lineup of speakers, including Dr. Rob Hanfield, from whom I've learned most of what I know about supply chain, uh, Dr. Heidi Schweitzer, with whom I've collaborated with on uh, several pretty interesting uh, ag economic projects and initiatives, and then Emmeline Michaela Bovitri, whose data visualization skills will really bring meaning and implications of data to a wider audience. Can you guys see my slides okay? 
Yes, we can. Okay, outstanding. We'll keep moving then. So many of you will recognize this little guy, the number muncher. Today, he'll be our Patronus, our muse, as we dive into some of my favorite um, and most regularly used transportation-related data sources and resources, uh, giving you all the numbers and data you can stomach. Uh, here's a little bit of what we'll cover, starting with manufacturing and the economy, and then diving in deeper by mode. So I'm gonna start by saying, first and foremost, this is more than a discussion of transportation data. It's bigger than that. And as I'm reminded by the Bayou Sage and general character, uh, James Carville's modern maxim, it's all about the economy. So bringing the economic viewpoint into this conversation in transportation is even more important today with the multimodal integration we see in every facet of our economic behavior. And then the rapid ongoing change, not just in transportation, but in our broader economy. We often say that freight is the physical manifestation of the economy and transportation makes it all possible. You know, we've surely had quite a year in transportation um, among all of our years, uh, but the good news is that freight activity is on the rise and, and perhaps in stranger ways than we might have predicted. So today is true of the Appian way, transportation makes it easy to access the marketplace and enjoy an improved quality of life. Today, transportation puts the marketplace right at our front door, uh, usually packaged into an Amazon box. Transportation infrastructure is also a great lever for economic development, both urban and rural, and always ranks at or near the top of site selection criteria, company recruiting. I think it's important to look at freight drivers, the manufacturing and production of goods, and leaving behind the laughable laugher curve, we'll talk about the real drivers, consumption and demand. Putting freight into context, one of the most important indicators of freight activity is the overall US industrial production index. This collection of data measures the real output of manufacturing, mining, and energy relative to a base year, like all indexes, and in this case, 2012. Together with these statistics, the total capacity utilization index, these two indicators are really kind of a collection of indicators, provide a great high-level view of our economy and tie directly to the levels of freight we'll see on our multimodal transportation network in the months and years to come. Tracked monthly by the FRED, or the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, these indicators provide, an amp, provide ample historical data uh, to use in trending and analysis. On the consumption side, the FRED also produces a set of data around personal consumption and personal income that offer insights, excuse me, that offer insights uh, into the purchasing behavior and purchasing power of the US consumer. As you can see by a quick visual take, these indicators are pretty closely linked. And uh, I think we can all guess what that sort of dip is. As we look at industry production and consumption, I find it helpful to focus on a, Q, a few key industrial sectors, uh, which classified by NAICS codes or the North American Industry Classification System. Uh, I've listed those at the bottom of the slide, and I can't do a presentation for Steve Burt without including some NAICS codes. Um, these, however, are not exhaustive. Thank you, Dana. You, what's that? Oh, oh say thank, thank you. you. Thanks for including the NACE codes. Appreciate it. Of course, of course, Steve. Viewed in tandem with the series of consumer price indices, we also get a pretty good understanding of the purchasing power of the U.S. consumer and keep tabs on inflation in the U.S. economy. Listed here are many of the federal agencies or international organizations that track economic data, including far more indicators and information than I've even mentioned today. And of course, let's not forget everyone's favorite, the ideal price index, the Fisher Price Index, of course, no relation uh, to the world that our children are being introduced to that we live in now. In a global marketplace, it's really important to be able to recognize the dynamics around currency valuation. And for the import and export of freight, the US dollar index, also known as, as the Dixie, is a high level metric that's worth paying attention to. The good news too is these data sources, they're tracked at both a national and a state level. And in some instances, down to the county or metro area, which really helps when you have a sharper scope on your analysis. Beyond federal data and research, there are ample resources in the academic or commercial space, space which might offer insight into the health of manufacturing, logistics, transportation, and other key economic lenses. I've shared a few examples from the Center for Business and Economic Research's 2020 Manufacturing Scorecard. And North Carolina, I hope you all zone in on that as I do. As you can see, we're doing fairly well, especially in production and innovation, productivity and innovation, 
uh, really a harbinger for future economic success and stability. NCDOT also has resources fo focused on freight in the economy, including the 2017 North Carolina Statewide Multimodal Freight Plan, which includes data, analysis, context, and other information about the freight and logistics ecosystem in our state. Stay tuned as we're starting the process now of updating this state freight plan, which will most likely be released in the next year. One of the tools I use most often from the NC uh, Statewide Freight Plan is the North Carolina Freight Flow Tool. This is an online Tableau-based dashboard, which provides a county-by-county -county data and information on commodity, mode, trade balance, key marketplace connections, and that happens at the county, state, national, and international level. The tool itself, uh, as most Tableau tools are, is very user-friendly. And don't, don't feel like you have to scratch down that link. I'll have a, a collection of links later in my presentation to leave with you. So as I dive in deeper into specific modes of transportation, I'd like to share some of my favorite and the most used data and research resources you know, that, I, that I, I work with. I'll start with the fastest mode, aviation. North Carolina's aviation and aerospace ecosystem is robust to say the least, with 10 commercial airports and more than 70 general aviation facilities which support travel and freight mobility needs of an industry across the state, of, of industry in general across the state, excuse me. This includes more than $61 billion in annual economic impact, employing more than 373,000 North Carolinians. In 2019, more than 1 million tons of cargo moved through North Carolina airports, worth upwards of $23 billion. For aviation data, I find the Federal Aviation Administration's data and research resources to be some of the best and most detailed. I've used this data for a comparative analysis for North Carolina airports, forecasting aviation freight activity, and many other applications. And although it's not freight related, I always find the unruly passenger statistics to be interesting. You know, over the past 20 years, we've seen an average of 174 incidents a year. Yet in 2020, US Airlines faced more than 2,000 incidents, ranging from refusals to follow the federal mask mandate, uh, harassing other passengers, even lawmakers, uh, and accosting flight attendants. That's quite the uptick. Hopefully it's a, a statistical anomaly we will stop seeing. Commercial reports also provide a great window into the health of aviation. Uh, and one of the most useful year after year is the state aerospace manufacturing rankings done by PricewaterhouseCoopers. North Carolina is doing well in these categories as well. As you can see, and my, as my friends in NCDOT's aviation group say, North Carolina always first in flight. Up next is for up the slowest, but most cost-effective mode, maritime. I started my career in the ultra exciting world of container shipping. So this mode has always had a special place in my heart. One of the best resources for data in this sector is the US Customs Automated Manifest System. This collection of all import freight records, lots of details derived from bills of lading and import security filings. This online database is updated regularly, I believe it's monthly, and has lots of historical data too. It is huge. It lives on the uh, AWS, uh, Amazon Web Service, and it's managed by a company called Enigma. Um, it's free to use, you have to register, but it gets a little confusing when you start to look for the AMS on AWS. USDOT's Maritime Administration, or MARAD, is also a great resource for maritime data, including port information, vessel information, and more. Another important federal agency here is the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, which maintain a host of maritime data, as well as other modes, but this one I find really useful, including port profiles, and they also produce regular reports for Congress that are just full of information. Uh, lastly, if you have all the money in the world, uh, there's no better maritime resource than IHS Markets uh, Peers data. It's expensive, but if it's maritime related, it's in there. So as we move to another mode, railroads, the data gets a little bit harder to find with proprietary issues surrounding class one railroads and really a, quite a complicated history of railroads public versus private infrastructure dynamics, there are limited data sources. One of the best sources of data, however, is the American Association of Railroads who regularly produce a series of reports, state level rail stats, fact sheets, and other infographics where you can glean a lot of information, relevant information and data. 
Railink is a commercial data and analytics firm that's actually based really close by in Cary, North Carolina, um, but has a national scope on rail and produces a report, which I think is very useful. And that's their annual North American freight car review, freight rail car review, excuse me. And I'll have a link for that later. At the federal level, the Service Transportation Board is essentially the regulatory oversight for rail has additional economic data, including performance, revenue, cost information, things like that. They offer a public use way bill sample, which is pretty helpful for analysis. And then there are some specific users who are able to secure more detailed confidential carload way bill samples. Uh, you've got to look in to see if you're one of those that qualifies as an other user, it's usually public agencies. And actually Heidi might talk a little bit about those way bills and some of the complications around way bills later. So now we'll briefly jump into highways and, and quite briefly. This is still the most significant mode for freight movement uh, with you know, upwards of 75% of all freight in the US uh, moving on trucks. When we talk about the economic importance of freight transportation and infrastructure, I find that it's really helpful to bring it back to dollars and cents. And through the use of probe data, which I think some of you may be familiar with, tracking cell phones and uh, connected vehicles, we are able to bring a, a quantification, a quantity, to the congestion costs for commercial vehicles on our highway network. This cost, the cost of being delayed, the cost of having a truck sit in traffic is very real to manufacturers, to supply chain businesses and, and commercial providers. Over the past year, we've developed a set of key metrics which we track to gauge the health and efficiency of our priority freight network in North Carolina. We also make a big effort to share this analysis with uh, nearly anyone who will listen. Uh, it's a regular data brief featured in our freight bulletin which if you subscribe is actually moving to a quarterly release schedule. So I'll have information more on how to sign up for that. But these numbers are, are pretty significant. Um, you know, for $240 million cost to commercial enterprise in 2020. So highways may be the most significant mode for tra freight transportation, but I'm not gonna spend too much time on highways because there's so much data out there. I've only got 10 or 15 minutes. I'm sure the music will start soon. Otherwise, we'd be here all day. Um, that said, one of the absolute best sources for data on, on highways and freight is the Federal Highway Administration's analysis data and uh, system, analysis data and system performance. They produce a ton of data looking at freight movement from so many angles. If it's collected, analyzed, or recorded, chances are they have it. So as I mentioned, here's a comprehensive list of the sources that I list. And this is maybe just a capture of my bookmarks, but things that really I think I use quite regularly. And I've even snuck in a few extras that I find helpful, but didn't cover today. Um, like I said, I'll make sure this is provided to you through our friends at ITRI uh, after the presentation. And I'll leave you with one last quote uh, that I think is really perfect for this conversation, coined by The Economist, a magazine that's nearly impossible to read cover to cover before the next one is delivered. But they say data is the new oil. And I think this audience can agree with that. Uh, wholeheartedly. So that's a broad overview of some of the data sources I find most useful in my daily life, uh, masquerading as an economist here at NCDOT, and I hope it'll offer you some resources to inform your own research and analysis. Uh, I'm glad I was be able to, to join you guys today and talk transportation data. Uh, and again, thanks to our friends at ITRI, who we do so much work with uh, for hosting. Here's my contact information if you'd like to connect. Uh, and you can also visit the array of logistics and freight resources online at our homepage or the NCDOT Connect resources page listed here. Thank you for your time and participation, and I, I welcome any questions. Dana, thank you very much for that presentation. Extremely insightful, and I think that list of data sources that you provided was absolutely invaluable. Um, one thing that I had in mind, sort of towards the start of your presentation, you highlighted a lot of uh, really excellent indicators related to economic activity centered around freight. And I was wondering if you had a sense of how North Carolina's freight productivity tracks um, with other states. You know, is there anything that we can be doing um, to bolster freight activities? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, North Carolina is doing well on productivity. And when you get down to the state level, you talk a lot more about employment data and, um, head count at, at a number of firms, but 
we really do have a, uh, a robust and, and I would say stable manufacturing environment here. So I think continuing to invest in resources that support manufacturing, manufacturing extension, uh, the community college system for workforce development, uh, bringing in um, uh, you know, defense department and military uh, veterans into the workforce. I think that's an asset that we have in North Carolina we have to continue to leverage. Um, and then the more and more we talk about supply chain as uh, really a holistic concept, you know, it's, it's, it became something people talked about when we ran out of toilet paper, but it, it's so much more than that. And, uh, and I think having these conversations will support continued manufacturing growth. Thank you very much, Dana. Yeah, absolutely. Great answer. Thank you. All right, Dr. Hanfield, you're up. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it looks like, yeah, it looks like, um, Perfect time to transition. I don't see any other questions uh, at the moment. So, um, Rob, I, I will uh, take the opportunity now to um, introduce you as you're pulling up your slides. So, um, Dr. Rob Hanfield is the Bank of America University Distinguished Professor of Supply Chain Management at North Carolina State University and Director of Supply Chain and the Director of the Supply Chain Resource Cooperative. He is considered a thought leader in the field of supply chain management and is an industry as is an industry expert in the field of strategic resource uh, planning, supply market intelligence, and supplier development. Rob has spoken on these subjects across the globe, including China, Azerbaijan, Turkey, Latin America, India, Europe, Korea, Japan, Canada, in multiple presentations and webinars. Rob has published more than 120 peer-reviewed journal articles and is regularly quoted in global news media such as the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, NPR, the Financial Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, and CNN. He has recently published an article on the shortage of PPE in the Harvard Business Review and the Milvane Quarterly Journal. So, um, you know, with, with my great pleasure, I, I hand it over to you, Rob. Uh, looking forward to your presentation. Great, thank you so much, Steve. And um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here today. And um, you know, I think I think uh, Dana made some great uh, comments around the availability uh, of all the different freight data that's out there. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is more around enterprise data. Rob, yeah. before you get started, this is Eugene. Um, you, we see your edit screen. If you want to put it in slideshow mode. Okay, I will try it in slideshow mode and uh, hopefully it'll work because it doesn't always work great for me, but um, I've got a Mac, so it, it, it's oh, a little- it's coming, it's coming up. Nope, still in edit mode. Okay, that's weird. Does it work now? Uh, no, we're still, at, we still see your edit mode. Can you try the, you know where the slideshow icon is? Oh, okay. You, you see the button up at the top left corner that says swap displays? Um, top left corner, I do not. Top, top left of your screen, there's an icon that says swap displays. Um, I do, oh yes, I do, yeah. Now okay. we're now you are you're good to go. Man, you're a Zoom master. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I'm going to be talking a little bit about data quality and data governance. You know, which which is a big concern. Um, you know, as we see more and more organizations moving towards uh, uh, Internet of Things, um, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, machine based learning, a lot of the new technologies. Uh, one of the things that they often overlook is the actual quality of the data itself. Uh, so four years ago, uh, we launched an annual uh, survey uh, called the Fourth Annual Data Quality and Governance Study. It is available. You can download it for free at our uh, uh, scm.ncsu.edu, which is our supply chain resource cooperative website. And I want to share a few insights from that because I do think it, uh, uh, it does you know, play a role as we start talking about data as how much data is available, how it's used, and uh, how people are using it. One of the things that we're, we're seeing more and more is, is as we move towards greater automation, uh, human uh, 
uh, computer interaction is going to be important. And I think humans will always sort of be in the loop. They'll always be interacting with data. But uh, an important requirement will be that we need people that are uh, have greater data literacy. And, and what do we mean by data literacy? We mean you know, the ability to interpret uh, and act on data. Uh, some of our results show that um, uh, basically data literacy in terms of advanced data literacy is fairly rare in most organizations. Um, and uh, we're also seeing that on, on average, most people you know, can understand data, but they're not very good at, at interpreting and acting on it. And, and we see this even a lot with some of our students. You know, they're very good at creating dashboards and Tableau and so forth. But when you ask them, you know, what is the meaning of that data? What do you do with it? Um, they're, they're less so uh, less inclined. So, so I think um, it, it's, it's becoming an important requirement that we have uh, individuals uh, who are able to not only look at the data, but you know, delve into it, uh, understand the st uh, statistical relationships between data and, and be able to take meaning from that data and be able to act on it. Uh, generally speaking, we see that uh, data literacy levels are, are extremely limited uh, in, in a lot of parts of the world. Um, in the US, we're, we're uh, I guess we're a little bit ahead of, of, of other regions. Um, in, in, uh, in Europe in particularly, uh, there's, there's some challenges there, uh, but we're also seeing the same, same trends as well in, in Africa and, and in the Asia Pacific. And this is important because as we start thinking about global supply chains, uh, we have to have uh, a global supply base that, that is data literate uh, and that can also communicate and share data. So when we talk about collaboration and, and collaboration between organizations, particularly transportation providers and so forth, um, we need to have people that, that can act on that data. As an example in transportation, what we might see at some point is you know, if you have a container that's coming from China, um, you would be able to uh, not only monitor the, the current status of that container, uh, but that if there were delays along the way, you, you might be able to uh, you know, act on that to be able to uh, uh, adjust your inventory levels, uh, adjust your minimum order quantities and so forth. So, so there might be a, a series of actions that occur when you start seeing these issues. Uh, as it relates to containers, by the way, uh, I'm sure most people in the audience have heard about the extreme uh, container shortages that are going on right now. And this is impacting uh, China as well. Uh, a lot of the containers that came over from China are sitting in people's rail yards or uh, in, behind factories. And there's actually a shortage or uh, there isn't enough uh, container capacity for a lot of the shipments coming over from China. So, so this is a data problem and um, we've got people that are starting to monitor and how to, how to manage those kinds of issues. A, a logical conclusion would be, well, if we're gonna be collaborating with suppliers uh, and other parties around the world, uh, shouldn't we be asking them as part of the RFI, request for information, request for proposal or request for quote? Uh, surprisingly, the majority of companies uh, do not specify, or at least a third do not specify data requirements. They just assume that suppliers will have them. And that is, uh, we think, a, a, a big mistake. Um, we, we think that uh, being clear in, in stating to suppliers, here's what your requirements are. Uh, you need to have uh, the ability to, to share inventory information, um, you know, the ability to be able to, to work in a collaborative manner using dashboards, using control towers, uh, and the ability to manipulate data in such a way that uh, you, can, you can understand what's happening in your, in your operation and in your, your supply chain. And, and we think that's an important requirement that people need to be at least giving some consideration to when they evaluate uh, suppliers that are out there. Um, this is another graphic that shows that uh, a little over half of people today believe their suppliers, three quarters of their suppliers are not able to satisfy data requirements. And, and this is certainly concerning as we say, because uh, a lot of suppliers particularly um, you, you know, diverse suppliers, um, small family-owned suppliers. Um, I've, I've seen some that, that don't even have uh, an internet connection. Uh, and so this, this is concerning. 
And, and this is also an issue when we start thinking about how uh, during COVID, uh, many people are, have moved to a work from home environment. Uh, if, if you're not digitally capable or, or not able to work um, you know, digitally across, across platforms, uh, this can also be a major risk when it comes to uh, you know, working, working through an issue like a, a pandemic or stay at home type of environment. So, so these, are, these are other concerns that exist today. We also ask people, well, where are you using data? What kinds of, what kinds of applications are you using data for? And uh, the majority of, of people said they're using it for you know, what we see are primarily sort of tactical kinds of operations. They're using it to, to optimize inventory, which is certainly important. Um, a, a few are starting to use it to, to monitor and, and manage suppliers. Uh, data is important when it's, it's being used for order shipment or invoice reconciliation. Um, what we often heard from many people is that often this was in disparate systems. You know, you had data in one system or data into another, and, and people were having to switch between systems to get uh, the same information. If you're dealing with FedEx or UPS or, or, uh, or Schneider or somebody else, you might have a different system you have to operate. So largely sort of standalone uh, requirements uh, in many cases. Uh, it's being used, uh, we're starting to see data being used for risk mitigation. Um, th this is a big concern at the moment, um, especially around uh, the next uh, thing around shipment tracking. Uh, we're working with some platforms like Resilink and others that, that are using uh, you know, data platforms to, to monitor global weather events and are uh, mapping their supply bases or their, their fleet onto those, those global events to be able to say, you know, what impacts are, are going on. A great example of this again is the, uh, the, the big freeze in Texas. Uh, people are still getting out of that, that, that essentially shut down uh, a lot of the polyethylene and ethylene um, supply chains. And uh, a lot of organizations are still recovering, shut down, you know, several automotive facilities um, because of, of that polyethylene shortage. And, and a lot of it, a lot of the, uh, those chemicals are used also in feedstocks uh, that go into uh, packaging materials. So, so major shortages, uh, still, still people are still bearing their way out from under that. Uh, being able to track shipments um, is important, especially when you start looking at uh, high value things like like drugs or uh, or pharmaceuticals or cigarettes or anything like that where you've got to be uh, monitoring the data on, on where that that truck is uh, dispute resolution believe it or not is is a concern you know, did it arrive on time uh, what time was specified when did it arrive being able to go back uh, and and have it, having to address those those disputes with carriers or customers that claim it was a late delivery and, and also uh, another potential area is, is returns optimization, which we don't see much of that going on just yet. Um, a lot of information that people would like to have, uh, there's very little visibility into the tier two and three suppliers, uh, very little visibility into the risks and the logistics events that are going on in those lower tier suppliers, very little visibility into actual inventory. So I, I was on a panel discussion talking about the vaccine and uh, you know, many people are getting the vaccine here in the US, but uh, there are extreme shortages of vaccines all around the world, including Europe. And one of the primary reasons for that is the lack of visibility into the raw materials that go into the vaccine. So, so this is really be, being problematic. Um, I think understanding uh, socioeconomic information, this is a big deal right now with the North Carolina DHHS as they're unrolling the vaccine distribution, they want to understand, uh, you know, what regions of the state uh, perhaps are have high declination rates, or um, you know, maybe are uh, uh, socioeconomically challenged, and and uh, and don't have transportation to to get to a vaccine site. So so this becomes important, and then also looking at, at weather or fulfillment accuracy and other other kinds of data forms are important. Interestingly enough, um, you know, a lot of companies say that they're in the process of sort of building dashboards, but as we return to the first issue of data quality, if you don't trust the data that you're reading, 
uh, how much are you going to rely on those dashboards and control towers? So uh, we are seeing a lot of organizations starting to pull these together. Uh, one of the things that's happening is we're seeing almost a plethora of dashboards coming out. Um, one hospital that I worked with in the Triangle area says they have over 500 Tableau dashboards that they've created, which you know is is renders it kind of useless. So so thinking about what tools, what metrics are important, um, how how to use the reports, and how to how to uh, really bring your team together around the data to make sense out of them is, is very important. Um, but we think that, that this area of, of consuming data will become increasingly important. Uh, another statistic that I'm not showing here, but which is in our report is uh, many people spend about two hours a day just trying to find the data they need. And uh, the number one tool that people are still using, you guessed it, Excel, right? So Excel is still the primary data anal analytic tool that, that organizations are using, which means it's not distributed, it's, it's on people's desktops. So uh, what our studies showed more generally, uh, people are using data to make decisions. There's some incremental pro uh, progress on this over time. Uh, the, the search for data is getting better, but people are still spending a lot of time cleansing data. Once they get it, cleaning it up, make sure it's usable. Um, people really don't, although uh, the economist says that uh, data is the new oil, people aren't valuing it as such. They're, they're not really valuing it as much as physical assets. And uh, we've emphasized the importance of, of data literacy as, as a critical element. Uh, we also find that uh, most organizations don't really have a good data strategy. So, so we're starting to see in some companies, uh, C, CIOs that are, are building a, a digital strategy and, and how, how this is going to impact every function, including logistics and freight. Um, and and uh, there's also going to need to be some significant changes in the training and the workforce to, uh, to enable that, especially as we start to roll out uh, AI and other, other uh, technologies in the future. So with that, I'll be happy to take uh, any, uh, any questions that might be out there. Rob, there were some, uh, a lot of good activity on the chat and the Q&A. So um, there was one question that was related to your second slide on um, data literacy. And um, the question was, you know, Europe is a surprise um, with its somewhat lower capabilities pertaining to data literacy. Do you know if there's any um, reason for this? Um, that's a, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, one of the one of the reasons we think in Europe that maybe data literacy is is lower than other parts of the world, we don't really know for sure, but possibly it might be, um, you know, due to uh, the language uh, issues that occur there. There's so many different languages that 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 exist in Europe. Uh, we think that the the focus on Brexit uh, has also uh, you know caused caused some concerns. I also think there's a lack of lack of standards and a lack of, um, you know, real really uh, emphasize uh, emphasize training around data literacy. Um, one of the organizations I worked with, Siemens, you know, I think is exceptional in this area. They've done uh, they've done a lot to really improve their data literacy issues. Um, but um, others are others uh, other organizations uh, in Europe have struggled a little bit. So. I'm not quite sure why, but it's it's an interesting question for sure. Thank you, Rob. And then uh, there was a comment that said, um, you, you know, pertaining to trust. Um, trust is in the data itself is a linchpin for making dashboards meaningful. And, um, you know, that was a really good point that you made. So um, just wanted to share that comment with you. And then I had one question for you as well. Uh, you mentioned that there is often good data that logistics firms may use, but it's being housed in disparate systems. I, I didn't know if you happen to know if there's any measures that are being adopted to address uh, that issue. You know, it, it, the, one of the measures I think, and, and I like the comment about trust. I mean, you have to trust the data, absolutely. Um, I think increasingly what we're seeing is organizations are creating dashboards which have uh, what I would call uh, APIs. So you, APIs are 
uh, basically a way of, of pulling data from multiple systems and pulling them into what's called a data lake. And that data lake then becomes the basis for that dashboard. So it's, it's, uh, you don't have to have all of the data uh, to, to be able to build a good control tower dashboard. You need to have the right data. So I, I think that's, that's part of the lesson learned there is, is really defining what data you need for these dashboards. And if you can do that and pull it in a way where it's cleansed, it's contained, it's, it's sort of protected, it's not getting, uh, it, it's not getting um, dirtied, if you will, or mucked up. You know, a lot of the enterprise systems that are out there have pretty lousy data. Um, but I, I think if you can, you can kind of create a, an environment to preserve that data and keep it clean, uh, you can have reliable data that people will trust. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate that thoughtful answer. Well, um, thank you for presenting. And I, I'm going to take the time now to um, introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Heidi Schweitzer, uh, who, who will be presenting for us here. So Heidi, as you pull up your slides, I'm going to provide your introduction. Uh, Heidi holds a PhD in agricultural and resource economics from the University of California at Davis. In addition to teaching and research, Heidi is a cooperative extension specialist addressing research topics that intersect both freight and agricultural market needs in North Carolina. In general, her work focuses on productivity, supply chain management, and transportation of agricultural commodities. She has specific interest in the contributions of freight transportation systems to agricultural marketing and food supply chain resiliency. So uh, with that being said, I'm gonna pass it over to you now, Heidi. Thanks for presenting with us. Oh, thanks, Stephen. Thanks for having me. Um, and actually, I've already learned a lot and I'll try to keep it brief because I'm really excited for what Emmeline is going to share with us as well. Um, so that was a great introduction. And I guess I the only thing I would like to add is the reason I chose this specific topic today is because it's a good example of where uh, agricultural markets and transportation markets um, intersect. And specifically, um, I have a research project where what I'm trying to look into is what ethanol production means for local agricultural rail markets. And the, there's a couple of reasons why this is pretty important. So if we look at commodity flow survey data, agriculture is the largest user of our nation's um, transportation system by ton miles. And the reason for that is because there's uh, high volumes moving from the middle of the US to export positions mostly, and it's fairly bulky. Um, so, so it's a big user of our transportation system. However, from a shipper's perspective, it's not very um, lucrative because if we compare uh, by, by weight and by volume, uh, a bushel of grain to a television, you know, one is worth $5 and the other is worth uh, several hundred dollars, but they might require the, a similar amount of um, shipping effort. Um, and so farmers, because of this bulkiness um, and, and the relatively low value per weight, farmers really do rely on railroads to market their grain because it's just not economically viable to truck it more than 100 miles or so. Um, and so this New York Times um, headline that I put here was just from the back in oil boom. And because farmers really need the railroads when they don't get um, service, um, that is, that is um, perfect. Oftentimes, the, there's some disputes between these two groups. Um, so really, uh, there's really important rail markets um, that farmers feel beholden to. Um, but railroads, you don't know, have many, many objectives and railroad and farmers are one, only one of their customers. Um, and then from a policy perspective, 
uh, actually ethanol, it, it sounds, uh, I guess, old fashioned, but the past presidential administrations as well as the Biden administration have been very supportive of including ethanol as part of US energy policy. And so it continues to be important, especially in the agricultural community um, to discuss. Uh, so a little bit of background and history um, is that in the mid 2000s, there was something called the renewable fuel standard. And that, that essentially requires a minimum volume of ethanol to be used in transportation fuel. And if you look at this, this line graph, the one on the left, you can see that the Energy Policy Act and the Energy Independence and Security Act, which really established that standard, that since then, the amount of fuel alcohol, the amount, the total amount of corn produced has increased and um, a much more significant increase has been in the amount of fuel alcohol from the corn that's produced. And something to know about ethanol is that ethanol is typically produced where corn is grown. Um, and that's because because of the transportation realities, which is that it's, it's cheaper to process, process corn um, and then ship the ethanol out by rail than to ship large quantities of corn um, longer distances. And so what that means since, since the renewable fuel standard went into place, what that means is that corn is more likely to be traveling by truck to its final destination. Now, the reason I mentioned this, and certainly Dana talk, uh, alluded to this a lot, and I don't think that this will be new for this audience, but transportation demand is derived demand. And um, since, I, since I am an economist who masquerades as um, a transportation person, uh, economists, we, we love supply and demand graphs, and we also love looking at prices specifically. And so what, what's important here is that there's different circumstances in the production region and the consumption region. Um, and if we were to change those market circumstances, then those spatial market relationships will change. And so what I'll show on the next slide is actually that um, I do have, I, I do use the Waybill sample, the confidential sample that Dana talked about, and I look at rail rates. And something that's generally true of transportation data is it's a lot easier to get flow data than it is to get prices. But of course, as an economist, I'm really interested in those transportation prices. So one of the benefits of the confidential waybill data is that uh, I actually get rail revenues. So I, I know the price that was paid for rail shipments. OK, so when I think about this question about what ethanol production means for local transport or local rail transportation, I focused specifically on Northwest Iowa, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is that I didn't want to have to deal with the fact that um, that rail can often compete with the inland waterway system. Um, and also I was looking for a really competitive rail market. So depending on the where you are in the US, there might only be one or two uh, carry, rail carriers. Um, but fortunately, uh, in Iowa, there's many rail carriers. Um, and then another important point is that land use in agriculture is very important, controlling for how land is used. Um, and so what I've done is, this is probably an application of some of the data sources Dana mentioned, is I've used that Wayville data and I've combined it with a lot of agricultural data and other types of um, 
other types of uh, transportation data um, to really tell me something about where the corn originates, uh, the shipment itself, and then also the market where it ends up. Um, and what I've found so far when I compare click where I, when I compare rail markets um, and shipments that originate in, in rail stations with no change in US, no change in nearby production compared to stations that have had you know, a new plant built nearby is that there is a significant reduction in rail revenues when ethanol capacity increases. And the reason I didn't put numbers here is simply because um, I'm currently in the process of making those estimates more precise. So for example, if there's a new 25 million gallon per year um, ethanol plant that's put in right next door to you, um, which is actually a fairly small plant, that's going to have a different effect than one that produces 200 million gallons per year, like those owned by ADM. And so ultimately, I think something that is lost when we consider, um, or in the plant siting models, when, we, when uh, policymakers are considering whether or not um, to build a new plant in their, in their um, area is it's important to think about um, transportation service providers as part of the supply chain and the fact that they, they do respond, uh, they are sensitive to quantity um, and price. Uh, and that's that's basically uh, what I wanted to share with you guys, and I hope I didn't take too much time. Hi, that's great. Thank you for sharing. I think your key finding that there's a significant reduction in rail revenues when nearby ethanol capacity increases, it's just really interesting um, for all the policy implications that we can think about. So uh, thank you for sharing your research. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's a good application of the transportation data that others have talked about. And, and ethanol is one example, but it could certainly, um, the, same, the same type of um, experiment could apply if you're thinking about other, other industries and other types of processing plants. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that there was a, a comment that was um, sent to you from Dana and you just said, uh, Heidi, you said it way, way better than I did <laughs> when you were going uh, through your um, description about um, drive demand for transportation. So, uh, you know, oh, thank you. friendly comment from Dana. And um, I just wanted to, I guess, let everybody know um, with keeping a tab on time, it's, these presentations will all be recorded. So if, if somebody for some reason in the audience has a hard stop at three, um, we will be circulating um, these afterwards, but um, we're gonna go ahead and um, continue a little bit past um, the, the three o'clock and whoever wants to stay on and has questions for um, Emmeline or the other panelists um, can go right ahead. So Heidi, thank you for um, your presentation and I'm gonna go ahead and um, transition over to Emmeline. So hi there, Emmeline. While you're pulling up your um, slides, I'm gonna provide your introduction to the group. Um, Emmeline McCaleb is a research assistant at the, or uh, is a data analyst at the Institute for Transportation Research and Education. Emmeline works across groups, including the Highway Systems Group, Economic Policy and Assessment Group, and the Bicycle and Pedestrian Group. Her main focus area is data visualization, specifically using Tableau and ArcGIS, uh, as well as survey research. Emmeline, um, your slides are all set. So uh, go ahead, uh, thanks for presenting with us. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, I'll just go ahead and jump into it since I know we're running short on time, um, but today I'm gonna be showing y'all three dashboards, two of which pertain to airports in North Carolina and one that pertains to bridges that are critical to agriculture in the state. 
Um, so before I dive into demoing the dashboards, I just wanted to touch on what my personal design goals are and why I think Tableau dashboards can be useful. Um, so first, I want to display data in a way that is visually appealing, comprehensive, interactive, and user-friendly. So I want to make sure that the data is displayed in a way that's preferable and more usable in most cases than something like just looking at an Excel sheet or something like that. Um, but I wanna make sure that it's not too visually overwhelming and I wanna make sure that um, it's user-friendly for any level of user that needs to use it. And then I also want to allow users to view um, summary level ag aggregate data or drill down to specifics depending on what their need is. And then lastly, I want to create a tool that provides useful and insightful analysis. So. I want to make something that is preferable, like I said, to just going into an Excel sheet or something like that. Um, so now I will pull up my first dashboard that I'm going to be showing y'all. Can everyone see this, the dashboard? Yes. Thank yes. you. Okay, morning. great. Um, so this first one is showing filed flight plans for North Carolina airports for federal fiscal year 2019. Um, and this is showing the 72 publicly owned airports in North Carolina. So just kind of an overall view of the dashboard. We have the map here, and then we have some information on the side here and a couple of filters on this side over here. So first, um, it defaults to showing arrivals and departures um, and you can filter this and you can see it just changes slightly um, but I'll just keep it on arrivals and departures for now and then you can also um, filter down to specific airports down here so if you just wanted to see um, for Wilmington International Airport for example you can filter that over here um, and you can see the number of total flights and the um, where the flights are coming to and from filters. And then for people that prefer to kind of view it in a table mode, we have the table over here where you can um, see just the specific number of flights that are going to or from a given place. But you can also um, use the map that we have to um, see kind of like the nodes going in between different places. If you're more of a visual person, it's definitely helpful for that sort of thing. And then the next dashboard that I'm going to be showing y'all is this one. This is showing the economic contribution of North Carolina airports in 2021. Um, so over here we have the economic output, the job supported and the wages earned. And this is just kind of the overall summary view. And then down here, we have the economic output, the job supported and the wage that the wages supported, um, showing the proportion of which each airport is contributing to that. And then you can also use the map view up here to see individual airports and what their contributions to the economy are. And also you can use these as filters to filter this over here, which I think is useful if um, you're maybe sharing a snapshot to someone that sort of thing, it can definitely be useful for that. And then the last one that I wanted to show y'all is this dashboard, which shows the bridges that are critical to North Carolina agriculture and commerce. Um, so we have the point map here, and then also a view of um, like the overhead satellite view which dynamically changes when you click on different points on the map and it's surprisingly accurate um, for the latitude and longitude. Sometimes you'll find, run into one that doesn't work, but overall, I think it's very useful. Um, and you can see that these um, bits of information are also dynamic. And then we also have a legend over here that functions as a highlighter as well. So if you wanted to see um, which bridges are 
you just want to see the functionally obsolete bridges, you can use that up here and then um, use that to use that to click on those. Um, and then we have more filters down here. So you can filter just by county. You can filter by division. You can filter by road type, um, by functional class, by weight limit. You can show just structurally deficient and just functionally obsolete um, or choose not to show them. And then all of these also are compatible with each other. Um, so if you wanted to see, let me see if I can find a county that has more, oops, more maps or more bridges rather. Um, you can filter the weight limit for that just to kind of drill down um, or you could go to division and just see the bridges that fit into a functional class and maybe ones that have a higher weight limit. Um, so I think it's a great tool if you're looking for something very specific um, and it could also be great if you're just trying to see what kind of the general landscape is in a specific division or a specific county as to kind of what condition the bridges are in. Um, too many windows open. Um, so yeah, that's all I had for y'all today. Um, if you have any questions or comments, be happy to answer them. And I also wanted to mention that all three of these dashboards are available on our Tableau public page. The Go link is there. Um, yeah, thank you. Online, right, that was great. I really uh, appreciate you sharing all the dashboards that you've been developing. I think um, you really showed how powerful these data tools can be, um, not only for visualization, but also um, for filtering through data and picking out um, the key metrics that you may be interested in. Um, Thank you. It looks like, oh, th that's great. So um, a couple of positive um, comments. So um, one was that um, ITRI's work for DOT Aviation has been outstanding. This is great to see it in more detail with Emmeline's presentation. So thanks for sharing that, Emmeline. And then another is that um, I'm going to explore the Bridges dashboard tool. Very cool. So uh, kudos, yeah, kudos to you, Emmeline. Um, you know, a couple of things I wanted to share really quickly. Oh, and Steve, just want to let you know, we just got a question in the Q&A. Oh, great. Um, or, or actually, it's a, com a question and a, a comment and a question. I'll let you read it. Okay. Um, so for the third dashboard, the satellite images for uh, every bridge are a great addition to the Tableau. Also supports the type of analysis shown. I was curious to learn if live, if this is live or pulling up images from a database. Yeah, so it communicates live with Google Maps. Um, so basically how it works is the data has the latitude and longitude, and then I just have a calculated field so that when you click on a specific point on the map, the latitude and longitude goes into there and it just pulls it directly from Google Maps. Thanks, Emmeline. Thank you for sharing that. Well, um, you know, a big thank you to all of our panelists and um, those in the audience who have attended today. Um, I think our, our second of the trilogy was a really interesting and successful webinar. And uh, in case any of you are interested in the upcoming um, webinar that is data applications in transportation planning. Um, join us on April 7th and uh, the registration link is here. I'll also include that registration link in um, an email that I'll be sending out that contains a video of today's webinar uh, presentation. And, um, you know, look forward to seeing everybody uh, for the next one. Ha have a good afternoon, everyone.